Through the years, as I've done pastoral counseling, a common theme often arises. It, it takes some time to kind of get to these questions because in many ways they're sort of embarrassingly basic, but they still tend to rise themselves. And, and they don't exactly put it in these words, variations of these themes. I know God loves the whole world. Everybody knows John 3.16. Does he really love me? I know that Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. But did he die for my sin? I know that he forgives the sins of the whole world. But does he forgive me? And if he does, why don't I feel loved and free and forgiven? We had a reading from the book of Romans, and this is Paul's most theological writing But at the same time, it's a very pastoral book. He's giving real answers to real questions that real people have. He doesn't philosophize through Romans. We don't know how many angels can dance on the head of a pen. That's not his point. The point of Romans is to let us know the height and the depth of God's love and God's forgiveness. And understanding what Paul is arguing here will move us from being dependent on the shifting sands of our emotions to the solid rock of the truth of God's word. Paul does it in this kind of wonderful progression using two words. Much more. Much more. I want to be like Paul or Moses here and ask you to take those two words and bind them on a, as a sign on your hand to make them as frontlets between your eyes to write them on the doorposts of your tent. I'm not asking you to run out and get a tattoo with it, but just being symbolic here. But put those words in front of you. Four times in chapter 5 he says much more. And each time he says much more, he opens the door to a greater vision of what God has done for us through Christ. And if we will embrace this vision, it will significantly, I mean significantly, address our doubts. First time it comes up is in verse 9. Since therefore we have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. The term justified is a legal term. It comes from the court. It means it's a not guilty verdict. We have lost the weight of our sins. Our old clothes no longer fit us. And so if it doesn't fit, you must acquit, right? Note what's given us this not guilty verdict. It's not our good works. It's not our sincerity. Nor does he suggest that we can really approach any way to God because all roads lead to God. None of that is an option here for Paul. There is only one thing that brings us the not guilty verdict, and it is the blood of Jesus. His sacrifice on the cross and his sacrifice alone pays for the sins of the whole world. No one else and nothing else does that. So St. Paul is arguing here, if we have been acquitted by the blood of Jesus, we have nothing to fear on the day of judgment. Nothing. If we've been acquitted in the past, then much more will be acquitted in the future. Second time he uses much more is in verse 10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. We've gone from the language of the court, justification, to the language of relationships, reconciliation. We still use that word today. A couple gets into trouble, they may even separate for a while, they go through counseling, they work through their problems, and when they come back together, they're said to be reconciled, right? It's a beautiful word, because it's it's far more personal than just justification. Because a judge can acquit you and still think you're as guilty as sin that you should have. But that's not the case here when he talks about this relationship being reconciled. Being reconciled speaks of healing. It speaks of an end of separation. It's the the father receiving the prodigal son. It's starting new and fresh all over again. It's tearing down walls that separate us. It's making loved ones out of enemies. And that's exactly what God did for us. For while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Making loved ones out of enemies. So we ask, does God really love me? Does God really forgive me? Does God really care? What St. Paul is arguing through this much more is, are you kidding me? He did all of this when you were his enemy. Imagine how much more he'll do for you now that you're his child. The third time St. Paul uses much more is verse 15. 
For the free gift is not like the trespass, for many died through one man's trespasses. Much more have the grace of God and the free gift by that grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, be abounded in. What's the free gift? He tells us in the next chapter, chapter 6, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you see the progression here? It's getting better and better. We're moving from just simply being justified to now reconciled to now being a free given, a free gift of eternal life. You know, there's, there's some parts of Judaism that do not believe in an afterlife at all. They're content to have a faithful relationship with God in this life, and they consider that a gift. And if you think about it, that's basically, wouldn't that be more than we even deserve just to be reconciled to God in this life? But he takes it much more. We're not only reconciled to God in this life, but then he offers us this reconciled relationship for eternity, much more. And then he moves on, if that's not good enough, to verse 17. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness, listen to this, reign in life through the one man Christ Jesus. Reign in life. Remember Minnie Pearl, she, she had this expression, I'm just so proud to be here. You know, that's kind of my attitude about heaven. I mean, if I get there, I'm just going to be proud to be there. I mean, don't you, most of us feel that way. But, but Paul's saying much more is going to happen than just being given entrance. He says that we will actually reign with Christ. Not just given entrance into heaven, but reign with Christ in that heaven. That's an amazing idea. Frankly, I don't even know what that means. I, I have no idea what that looks like. To me, it, it certainly harkens back to what Adam lost through sin, right? Because he had been set up to have dominion over the earth. He was set up to reign. But through sin, he lost that position. And I, I imagine what St. Paul is speaking about here, because he brings it up to Timothy, too, again. If we endure with him, we will reign with him. It's just factual from St. Paul's point of view. And while we may not understand exactly what that looks like, it probably will be something of the nature of being returned to that original position that Adam lost through the fall, only it'll be, guess what? Much more. Okay, so let's, let's assume that the early church bought what, what Paul is saying here in Romans, and they've embraced the truth, they've replaced their doubts, God loves them, God cares for them, they've been reconciled to God, They've invited in this eternal relationship. One day they're not going to roll with Christ, reign with Christ. And then life shows up. Like it does for all of us who believe. And I can kind of see a little handwritten note going back to Paul saying, well, we read your letter from Romans. Man, that sounds good, but you're about to be arrested and we're getting pummeled out here. I mean, we, they're taking us and feeding us to lions. So, so how does that all fit in with all this much more stuff? And doesn't life feel like that sometimes? You, you sort of begin to embrace the truths of God and then, and then life shows up and you wonder, how does this fit? How does, how does this sort of victory in Christ that I'm supposed to be walking in fit with the fact that my life is just crumbling around all around me? And I wonder if Paul didn't anticipate that question and that's why he does sort of this preemptive strike of right at the beginning of this argument bringing up the whole issue of, of suffering and puts it in perspective. Being justified by faith and having peace with God, he points out in verses 3 and 4, does not exempt you from suffering. But rather, once reconciled with God, what happens is it brings meaning to your suffering. We recently sang a beautiful hymn a couple weeks ago, and there was this line in there that so caught my attention. When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee. I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. St. Paul's telling us that we're to have faith that, that suffering produces endurance and endurance character and character hope. And we have this hope that God loves us and so there's purpose even to our suffering. So neither Paul's future arrest nor their excommunication from the synagogues nor their arrest by the Romans and he goes on and writes in chapter 8 nor death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Paul, Paul strengthens our weak needs by calling us in essence to have faith in the Trinity of faith 
and hope and love. And that's what anchors our souls in the midst of all this going on in our lives and all around. If you're on this Lenten journey, you're going to be facing probably some of the questions that I brought up at the beginning of the sermon because it's the nature of this penitential season to take a hard, soul-searching look at ourselves. Besides embracing much more to ground you, I want to just quickly call your attention to two things. First, remember that the kind of doubt that, that I brought up at the beginning, I, I think there can be a healthy use of doubt. Sometimes our struggling with God can strengthen us, but not this kind of doubt. The kind of doubt that asks, are you truly forgiven? Are you truly loved? I don't think that's a healthy kind of doubt. That kind of doubt, those kind of questions, I think come from the enemy of your soul, who the scripture calls the accuser of the brethren. He did the same thing to Jesus. If you are the Son of God, right? He kept, that was his refrain. If you, see the seeds of doubt he's trying to sow? If you are the Son of God. And so that's why sometimes we hear, well, if you're really forgiven, well, if you're really loved, that's not from, that's not from God. In your heart and mind, you must know. If you hear, are you really loved? Are you really forgiven? Know where it's coming from. But then secondly, confront those doubts head on with the truth. Exactly what Jesus did. The doubt came in. If you are the Son of God, the response back was, it is written. Right? That's where we stand is on God's Word. You may find a passage of Scripture that helps you get through this. You may find a prayer that centers you. One of the things I appreciate that the Eastern Orthodox Church does to center themselves. There's this beautiful prayer they call the Jesus Prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And that's just breathed in and breathed out until the doubts flow away. Some in the West pray the rosary. That may not be your tradition. But stabilize yourself with God's Word. I, I personally, what I've done is I've woven a favorite passage from Ephesians with a favorite passage from Hebrews. And I recite them like a mantra when I'm starting to feel weak in the knees. And the, if you are, questions come to me. I retort, I am accepted in the Beloved and His kingdom cannot be shaken. I am accepted in the Beloved and His kingdom cannot be shaken. I am accepted in the Beloved and His kingdom cannot be shaken. And after a while, the little ghosties and ghoulies just sort of disappear. The point is, confront the lies of the enemy with the truth of God, just as Jesus did. And then, like Jesus, by the end of Lent, you'll come through victorious. I have a sneaking suspicion that St. Paul's unfolding of much more in Romans is really only meant to be a highlight of what God has in store for us. More than just justification, more, more than reconciliation, more than even being called heirs. Because later he writes to the Corinthians, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love Him. So when assailed, when assailed by doubt and fear, does God really love me? Does God really forgive me? You have an abundance of assurance from His Word. And you can smile to yourself and say, Oh, yes, and much more. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.